we're going to see now is a part, partial history. Um, Lance, are you with us? Yes, Lance, come forward, please. Um, we have the subject of the film with us. We are very lucky to have Lance Wyman with us. He designed many things, um, one of which you'll see tonight, which was the graphics for the Olympics. Have a seat here. You don't mind. You don't mind. Um, in 1968. Now, when Julie, in order for this film to make any sense to you at all, and for it not to seem too Pevsnerian, um, it's in the context of her larger research on how the Olympics are designed to either lock down the idea of the nation or possibly open up the idea of the nation. And she also looks at how design intended for one purpose can be co-opted and transformed for others, so unintended effects, which is partly the story of this film, correct? So I offer it as a selective narrative, selected out of an ongoing research of a colleague who is not with us tonight because her, oh, she is, Jilly. Oh, no, no, I shouldn't be talking for you. I thought we were working on your exhibition. Well, have I characterized it correctly? Okay, all right. Um, so, I suggest that we spend a few minutes talking to Lance and Jilly, those of us who wish to, and we have a certain looseness about this, which was a surprise, a really great surprise, and that we start the um, keynote maybe at five after six, or is it 10 after six, to accommodate this opportunity and celebrate the opportunity. Um, Lance, you may not remember, but we met when I was working for Lisa Taylor at Cooper Healy. We're both really <laughs> old. <laughs> um, and I have your work in my first book, The Age of the Millennium. And I'm very honored to be here on stage with you. And I just think it's remarkable to see you celebrate the transformation and appropriation of your work. Appropriation was something we think we invented. This is another dimension of history, is disabusing ourselves of the fact that anything is sui generis. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, that, was, that was, you know, quite generous. Um, and was there anything that, I mean, this is a segment um, from the director's point of view, from your point of view as the subject, that you want to add to this or, or contextualize it for the audience? Oh, uh, I really can't add too much to it, but I'd be certainly happy to answer <coughs> any questions that you would have. I think that was pretty complete, and uh, I think Julie captured a lot of what the actual experience was in, um, you know, designing the program and then having the student uprising, and then years later, uh, that was an extremely emotional experience I had at uh, the university in Mexico City when the, um, the rector gave me that book. I mean, it really did feel like some kind of a cleansing or something. And I don't think I really realized how I carried that for all those years up until that point. You so I'd be very happy to, you know, answer anything that you... You said at one point that you felt kind of dirty for working for the Mexican government, but when you started the project, were you cognizant of potential unrest? Were you... I mean, the States is in a period of unrest. Europe's... Lot, most of the world in 68 was torn up. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we, were, we were in Mexico for about two years. Well, I, I, at that one point, that 18-month period when we were kind of into the program. So we really kind of lost touch with a lot of what was going down here in the States and in other places in the world. I was so involved with that program, so uh, I really didn't anticipate something like that happening. Well, that's right. It's pre-fax, pre-tweet, pre... -fax, pre, -tweet, pre the, the isolation's genuine. That's a very interesting factor. Yeah, we were isolated. Was the perception of the... I mean, Today, I mean, of course, I think there's a new president of Mexico who's getting lots of kudos for his improvements, but Mexican government can evoke complicated ideas. Did it have that same connotation then? Well, I'll tell you something. The only thing I knew really about Mexico before going down there is they had piñatas. I mean, I didn't get a big education on Mexico here, and uh, when I got there and really opened my eyes and saw what was there as far as the ancient cultures were concerned and the country itself was concerned. I mean, it was a very, very rich experience. And um, I think at that point, Mexican designers really were trying to emulate Europe. They were trying to emulate the United States. Japan was kind of big on the horizon in design at that point. 
So it was a, a really an opportunity to really see the place, fall in love with it, and utilize, make in a contemporary uh, way, some of the history and some of the culture come back to life, really. And I feel very good about that, because it has had an influence on Mexico, and got, you know, Mexico has had a big influence on my work. I mean, that's very early in my career. So uh, in that sense, it was, there wasn't a lot of predetermination going on. It was really just jumping in and uh, you know, kind of doing it. I, I did follow my nose with that. And Ramitas Vasquez was a very, uh, very savvy director. He was an architect. He was a, I call him a kind of a friend, a good dictator, because, you know, we didn't have much time. And that time when uh, Atul Eicher came in, I was down there with Peter Murdoch, and we had about 18 months before the uh, Olympics started. And he just walked in and he treated us like a couple of little kids and looked around and said, um, you know, we're further ahead than you. Now, they had, to, they had four years plus 18 months, and uh, it was a little unnerving, uh, you know, actually. So uh, there were those kind of uh, questionable things that came up along the way in developing that program, and there's a lot of stories involved with uh, a lot of things, but, you know, it's kind of hung in there, and I'm, I'm always a little surprised how, how much that has hung in, but I have to look back and say that it was a process where decisions were made uh, I mean, we've all done work um, where committees have to get involved. You have a lot of, you know, things that have to be uh, gotten through before you get to a final solution or a final, ap you know, actual happening of a design program being implemented. And this was really streamlined. And uh, in a way, I think that helped. And I had, I mean, I have to say, I worked for George Nelson before I went mm. down there. So. I had one of the better backgrounds. I mean, besides having the ability to do the work, I had insightful uh, experiences in my background, so I was able to apply that. I, I think of it as a period in my life where kind of all the stars lined up, you know? I had the experience, I got the opportunity, uh, everything really kind of um, worked Well, you out. know, when you talk about George, it reminds me, and I'll, I'm sorry if I interrupted your question, but that um, George was able to do things like Designed the Moscow USA exhibition where Khrushchev and Nixon had their debate, their kitchen debate, and do a film for MoMA called USA versus Us. You could be critical of the hand that fed you. And in a sense, there was this space that doesn't seem to exist anymore where you could almost, you know, um, you wouldn't lose the opportunity to work for USAID, which was basically a propaganda organ, if you were critical as well in another sphere, which probably wouldn't happen today. If someone went to Sochi with a design for the Olympics and snuck in the rainbow, they would not have that job. I mean, I, I, was, I had this horrible argument with a dear friend. I said, you know, I'm really torn. I said, I don't think we should go. I don't think that we should be in Sochi. It's just a, such a horrific time. And they said, oh, they totally disagreed that you should be above politics in that case. And I thought, how can you have that schizophrenic split? And maybe being inside, you know, when you're the athlete who's trained for 14 years straight, you can't. But I don't know. This is, this is these are this is why Julie's research is so interesting. Questions? Yeah. Talk. Um, I happen to know that you're an industrial designer. So, what, is the, what do you say about like your training in industrial design leading to that kind of graphics? Um. You want the full story in that one? <laughs> <laughs> I was really a lousy high school student, and I couldn't get into Pratt. I mean, this is the truth. And I had to go to a uh, junior college for a year and maintain a B-plus average. And I wound up going to Fairleigh Dickinson over in Rutherford, New Jersey for a year, and I had an English teacher. His name was Richard Holub. And he, uh, I was, you know, at that period, I was right in between Korea and Vietnam, so I was just kind of missing going to either one of them. Uh, but at that time, all the uh, Korean vets were coming back, and they came into the first English class, I remember this, and Holub said, we're not gonna have books. And these guys went bananas, like, books? We, we need, have to have books, man. You know, we're studying English. He said, we speak English, we'll get enough English. But he said, what we're gonna do is go out and analyze communication. And uh, we're gonna come back and, and see what happens when communication doesn't work. We did that for a whole semester. I never had an experience like that in any design class I ever had. I, I really had a sense of communication being something that if it works, you've succeeded. And if it doesn't work, 
you failed. And as a, as a graphic designer uh, or any kind of a communicator, that's a good bottom line to be made aware of. So I always had a, uh, an interest to do graphics, but I, they didn't teach graphic design when I got out of uh, school. And I met a, uh, a, a designer from uh, Yale who was studying with Paul Rand in their program up there. It was, an, it was a graduate program. And I never turned back. And that was at a General Motors program. So, uh, But to get back to your Tucker's question, uh, you know, form is form. And uh, I've taught spatial graphics. And one of the hardest, thing, hardest things for graphic designers, it seems, is to uh, use space as a, as a uh, you know, a method of uh, conceptualizing. I mean, we live in we live in space, and yet somehow they ground into uh, graphic designers uh, a flat world. And I've always been a little concerned about that, as far as trying to teach uh, spatial design to people who have come through the graphic design training. So I think I was lucky, Tucker, that I, I had a bent for um, communication and. You know, my industrial design training gave me a sense of uh, being able to work on systems, uh, being able to communicate with form, and um, that all, you know, it all kind of comes together. I was just out in, um, in uh, Minneapolis. I, was at I gave a talk at the Walker last uh, Thursday, and if you're interested, I, I, didn't, I haven't even seen the whole thing. It's just up now, and I talk about some of these things, and they were a very, very good audience, and I think... Uh, some of the questions they asked after the talk, um, well, I'll have to see them myself, but it was a good experience answering some of the questions because they were very, very intelligent and very delving uh, into the experience of, you know, making things work and where do, you, where do you come from? What are the experiences that we have to have to learn how to, if we're communicators, communicate? And uh, that was certainly one of mine with, um, his name was Richard Holub, Dick Holub. He was a basketball coach, so when those guys wanted books, he was able to handle that. And he had a wonderful, wonderful class. So when you went out in that class, because that sounds like an amazing class, you had to sustain conversations with people you didn't know. Uh, that was part no. of it. I think what, what the real, you know, the real thing that got me is that we had to come back in and have had experiences where communication failed and uh, figure out why it failed. Sometimes it was the communicator, sometimes it was the other end of, you know, um, but it was, it was really important for me. I think I learned a lot. So that's how I got from industrial design into uh, being able to communicate. More questions? Yep, Rama. Is this, is this the same George Nelson? I don't, I don't recall, yeah. Uh, yeah. He did a, uh, a couple of large projects in Sao Paulo, um, and he was originally. Yeah, I wasn't aware of them, actually. Yeah. Funny, I thought of Barragon when I saw the pink and yellow arcs. Did you meet Barragon when you were in I worked with I worked with Barragon on the uh, Camino Real project, yeah. Oh. I did the graphics for the Camino Real Hotel, and uh, Barragon was one of the consultants to uh, Ricardo Legaretta both oh. Barragon and Matthias Gerritz, so, yeah. So we could map this history in <laughs> modally, uh, and we might want to enlist Peter to do that, um, but I think that it would be a good idea if we took a five-minute break, stretch your legs, and then anybody wants to stay and talk to Lance while he's here, do that, but I think we're, really everybody should feel free to go outside, grab coffee, grab a glass of wine, and we'll start again in roughly five minutes. Good luck. Okay, thank you thanks. so much. Oh. So good to see you.